Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. So we are on. So this is accounts, and today is um, Monday, October 17, 2022, and it is 6.04 p.m., and we're starting our accounts um, meeting tonight, and we have a quorum. It's um, Councilor Rita Mendez, Councilor Maria Tavares, and Councilor Wynne Farwell. And we are so happy to be here tonight with our new city auditor, Karen Prevail. So tonight our meeting will be a little bit different. Usually we just um, review the warrants and we ask questions on the actual numbers. But tonight we're going to have a very good overview of what actually the city auditor does in, uh, in the city and the responsibilities and roles. So we're excited to have you. Welcome. We Thank had you. you when you had the whole budget and you were thrown into that. So you survived that. So this should be super uh, simple and exciting. I know you're super motivated and you gave us great uh, insights on what your plans and roles are for the um, city auditor's office. So we're just happy to have you here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, um, Councilor Mendez. I'm happy to be here and you know, as part of the agenda, I wanted to talk about what my role is as a city auditor and what we do in our department, in the auditing department. First and foremost, I'm here to provide assurance that all of our financial transactions are undertaken in accordance to federal and state law and that they're executed legally, efficiently, and effectively. I'm not only here just to um, protect the fiduciary interests of the city, but also I want to build relationships with our, all stakeholders so that we can build communication, working with coworkers, working with customers, working with city councilors, working in a constructive and a positive manner where we're all learning, but we're able to move forward um, in an efficient way. Some of my tasks as the city auditor is approving all of the bills, examining and improving payments of vendor payments that come into the city based on the city side and the school side. I'm also in charge of reviewing all the payroll for the city and for the school and making sure that as we're paying employees, we're paying them accordance to their contracts. I'm also in charge of making sure that goods and materials are being charged to the proper chart of accounts, confirming that goods and services that departments order have been received and have been reviewed. I'm also charged with posting all the receivables and reviewing the revenue that comes into the treasurer's office and making sure they're posted to the proper accounts. In addition to all of that, my role includes maintaining books of accounts and financial records. That would include tracking journal entries, um, running ledger reports, running sub-ledger, subsidiary ledger reports, and reviewing all funds, so that'll be our general funds, our enterprise funds, and our trust funds. A lot of, um, within my role, I'm also in charge of managing the grants and making sure that all of the city council approved agendas have been posted for if there's any transfers, if there are any grants that have been awarded. My position is to make sure that the city has that money tracked and is available so that during budget season, we're able to provide a list and information to the finance department so that the city can see the amount of work that the state is investing in Brockton and the different projects that we're working on. Does anybody have any questions in terms of my role um, as auditor? And I can go on to some of the initiatives and um, in the DLS calendar, you can kind of get an idea of some of the deadlines that we have. Okay. The um, Division of Local Services calendar is a guideline, and it can be found on the um, DLS website. Um, for, and a lot of the guidelines are based off of best practices that are set forth by the, the Department of Revenue. The Department of Revenue has to certify our free cash. They have to review all of the entries that we submit um, to the state before they can approve our budget. So. In September, at the end of September, I work with the school department 
DESE uses a report to determine the community's compliance with the prior year and current year um, um, net school spending requirements, so I work closely with the school. All of this stuff usually happens at the end of the September. Our fiscal year runs from July 1st to June 30th. So we're in fiscal year FY23, which j runs from July 1st of 2022 to June 30th of 2023. All the transactions that occur within that period of time have to pre be presented and recorded to the Department of Revenue. So between July and November is a time that we're doing different journal entries. We're making sure that our accruals are done and making sure that everything that has been submitted has been submitted properly and balances out. At the end of and I'm only going over this calendar, the, and I can provide a copy to anybody that like it. It includes the, everybody's role in the city, so the taxpayer, the assessors, the accountant, and which each department head's um, task is at different periods of time during the fiscal year. But tonight I'm just going over some of the deadlines that we have um, as the um, city auditor. The biggest deadline um, for the city is our Schedule A. It's due by the end of um, the end of November, November 30th, and that report really outlines all the spending by fund, by type, and that's something you know when that has been submitted. If the committee would like to review that, just to see an overview of what the city um, has brought in for revenue what we have expensed in all the different categories, what we have in terms of our liabilities, what our trust accounts look at, like that schedule gives you a really good overview of all the transactions that have occurred um, for the city for the entire fiscal year. And that's done once a year, that's submitted to the Department of Revenue that has to be reviewed and then approved. Um, between, usually, the balance sheet, I, I just wanted to mention September, in October, at the end of September, these are guidelines in terms of when we need to submit things, but I work with the treasurer's office and at the end of September, September 30th, we do submit our statement of indebtedness and the treasurer's year-to-date in cash records, and that is compared to what we have in the general ledger, and they both have to match. So we do cash reconciliation for the um, prior fiscal year, and we go over our account receivables. Once our balance sheet has been submitted to the Department of Revenue, we've closed out the fiscal year, that's when the state will start reviewing what surplus the city has that they will determine as free cash. And you know, at some time, if you wanted to go over the exercise of what that in, um, entails, I can put together you know, a PowerPoint. I could put together just a presentation that explains that process as well. So this is, this is just the calendar in terms of um, what we're working on right now. Does anybody have any questions on the calendar? Okay, I'll go to the next agenda item. So um, I started. I started with the city at the end of May, and one of my the biggest initiative that I have in my department is putting together policies and procedures, putting together best practices, putting together manuals so that everything we do in the city can be tracked and that we're using consistent forms and we're using and everyone understands um, what's required. A lot of it isn't just this is what you need to do, but it comes with education and explaining to departments why by state law we can and cannot do things in local government. So I'm really looking to educate departments on you know state <coughs> law and what is allowed and what's not allowed, but then also looking to put together policies and procedures so that as we're researching and looking for the information or if we have questions, everybody understands and we're setting um, pretty much the state and what, is ex what we're expecting and setting up expectations in the department's understanding and what I expect and what I can do 
in charge to do as the city auditor to go into a few of the forms that we have been working on. One is our purchase order system. So in August, we implemented a purchase order guide and I can provide copies if anybody's interested in looking at it, is a draft. With any change you make in the city, it takes time and it takes training so people understand, you know, the process and you know maybe they haven't had access to the financial systems or they've had practice using it. So we've been working with apartments. <laughs> with the purchase order guide, it really explains what a purchase order is, the type of purchase orders that are created when requisitions are submitted. So if the city has um, a contract or they have a grant or they have a blanket PO because they're making um, for utility payments, we are now encumbering and creating a purchase order for the total amount. Or if we have a contract that has been authorized and approved by the department, the mayor, the city council, we're encumbering the entire amount of the contract so that any period of time we can look and see how much has been expensed. We can look and see what the balance is and it gives us a control to make sure that the vendor is not overspending. If we're only submitting a purchase order to pay an invoice, there's no way to really track it. it there's a way to track it, but it's more time consuming because you'd have to run every vendor activity report to find out what that vendor was paid. So we have put in a new policy that all of the invoices that are paid are scanned into the purchase order. So we don't have to go in files and find an invoice if you're interested in a vendor and what has been paid or if a vendor <laughs> calls up, they're not sure if an invoice has been paid. Anybody would have access in the city that has access to Munis to go in, look at the purchase order that was set up, that was approved, that has gone through procurement, and see all the payments that were made for the entire fiscal year. So those are some of the so those are some of the changes. We've put in some internal controls within the auditing department in terms of review. We have more than you know one or two set of eyes that are reviewing this. I sign off on what's been paid, but I also review and I go through the invoices. I think that as a department head, you can't just approve, but sometimes you need to go through the process to understand what, you know, everyone in your staff and what some of the, you know, accounts payable clerks are actually doing to understand everybody's role. And that's a way that you can see if there's things that have to be adjusted or altered so that um, things are paid and they're not missed and then making sure that you have the proper training. So that's something that I've been doing over the last um, five months is sitting down and actually running a vendor warrant myself, you know, when staff is out and making sure that everybody is cross-trained. Because we don't want, our department is, um, is, is a critical department. I mean, we're paying vendors that are doing services for us. We're paying employees. So the more that our staff is educated and trained, the more that we can run an efficient office. So that's one thing that I'm working on in our office is cross-training. So that's just some of the some of things that we have um, put in place. We're also, you know, looking into training um, with our department, just making sure that everybody's up to date on the municipal law. The um, the state in general, the inspector general's office has different classes on 30B. So as we have a procurement officer, if we're looking and understand what can be processed through 30B or Chapter 49 for you know mm -hmm. for goods and services. That education just helps our department in terms of reviewing and um, approving invoices as they come in. We've updated forms, so we now have standard forms for our travel reimbursement. So if anyone goes on a trip or if they're using their car during work um, hours and it's within the contract, we have a form that they have to fill out and procedures in terms of how to be reimbursed or if they're taking classes. So both the school department and the city, they've received those new forms and instructions. We're constantly when our, in our office working with each department and training them and walking through, going over, or, um, you know, if they have questions, we're answering the questions just so that everybody can slowly change. You know, change sometimes can be hard, but I think with repetition, it's um, definitely beneficial. So those are some of the things I've been working on um, 
and the auditing office. And it goes on and on of the things. I could have another agenda for the next meeting and you know talk about phase two of what we're working on. Um, right now, we're undertaking, uh, you know, a whole grant uh, reconciliation and putting together a new grant module. So we'll have a tracking system for all of the grants that are approved um, for the city. Okay, Councillor Fowell. It, it, I guess, uh, it's important that the public understands five hundred and fifteen million dollars goes through your office and, and you're responsible for making sure that it's paid properly to the right person and in the right amount. And I, I think sometimes people view auditing as just a paper shuffle and, and as I said before the meeting, it, it's just so much more than that. Um, a couple of technical questions. We get a load of heating oil um, for one of our city buildings and the purchase order is sent to your office. How quickly do we pay our vendors? Have we shortened up the time when, when a vendor has to wait for payment? Because I know in small business that's important. We have um, shortened our time. I had a pretty ambitious goal of a week turnaround, um, which I don't feel at this time is, is doable in terms of um, our staffing. We're in the process of filling more than four positions in our department. So my goal is to have at least a one week to two week turnaround for vendors. So if it's submitted on a particular day, we can provide the vendor or the department head an estimated time of when that check will be cut. So those are things that we're working on. Um, I think when we're fully staffed, right now we have one uh, accounts pay um, administrator that's working and we have an intern that's working part-time so we we lost a staff member um, so we're bringing in some temps this week but we were you know fully caught up with payment at the end of the summer there were some um, vacations and some uncertain un, un, um, explained circumstances that came up where staff weren't there but I'm in the process of making sure that we have the staffing capacity to be able to have a turnaround between one to two weeks. My goal would be one week, um, just making sure we have the staffing. And that's why within my department, with the administrative assistant positions, that we're cross-training. So that if someone's out of the office or somebody's sick or someone's on vacation, work doesn't stop. And that everyone's trained um, so that we're all looking at it within the same lens as an auditor will look at anything that we're paid. So we're, that's our goal that we're working towards um, in terms of payments. Now, as you know, we get a budget book, and it's hundreds and hundreds of pages. And each department, uh, putting aside personal services, whether it's overtime, not overtime, and there are all these line items under ordinary maintenance where departments say they're going to spend money. But we're only really approving the ordinary maintenance amount, and they get to switch amounts between certain line items. Uh, for example, building supplies might be this amount, but maybe they decide they need the money for something else like fuel for trucks or something. Are you notified when those transfers within line items in ordinary maintenance are done so that we actually have a true and accurate accounting of what did we spend during a fiscal year for this particular commodity or this particular purpose? Yes, we are doing that. So I'm doing the process a little differently. So the city council votes, like you were saying, the salary and wages, the overtime, purchase of services, goods and supplies. Sometimes there might be um, you know, travel and training. And within those statutory categories, then you have the detail, where you have office supplies. Each department, if they go over, they cannot go over the bottom aggregate amount of that particular um, statutory category. So if, for instance, if they had $10,000 that they could spend on goods and supplies, and they budgeted $1,000 for office supplies, $2,000 for gas, if they go over that budget, that's being monitored on a quarterly basis. I'm working, actually it's being recorded monthly, and so I'm working with the finance department. So if any given 
time, I can look and I can see what the actual expenses are. Because the most important thing is to make sure that we're charging it to the proper charter accounts. So when departments are entering the requisitions into Munis, I'm reviewing that before we print a PO. So if I see a requisition that's being charged to the wrong charter account, if it's a purchase or service where it should be a good and supply, that department head would be notified so that they're encumbering under the proper charter accounts and then making sure we have enough money in the budget to cover that. So that's something that I review um, as I go over the requisitions and as I'm paying the bills as well. All right. One of the questions we're always asked, and it's usually during election time, and I suspect it'll come up again uh, next year, is who audits auditing? In other words, who oversees, and I, I think I know the answer to this, but for the public, who oversees the fact that the city of Brockton as an entity is spending within the amount of revenue that we're bringing in and, and within the amount that's appropriated by the city council? What, what oversight is there over? over municipalities, I guess. So there's two, there's two oversights. We have an outside auditor, which is um, Clifton Lawson Allen, and they review all of our financials and our financial statements. So they're going to, they'll look at our budget to actual. And that's something that I'm reviewing. That's something that the finance office is also going because we cannot allow a department, by law, they can't overspend the appropriation that has been authorized by city council. So that's one um, entity, they usually come twice a year. So they come usually in spring, in the springtime, and they will pull samples. So they will look at, you know, our appropriations, and they'll see <clears throat> were the appropriations booked the proper way, were the transfers done properly, are we transferring funds in accordance to state law. So they review that, and then the second is the Department of Revenue our budget has to be approved at the end of the fiscal year. We have to report every expenditure, every transfer, every, um, you know, we, anything that we run in a deficit. We're reviewing revenue for all of our grants. So there's a lot of reports and there's a oversight of what the city does. And they then, and with our outside artists, they'll provide a management letter. And that management letter will give you an overview of what they have found or they feel are areas that need for improvement or if the city's doing you know, perfectly fine, they'll make note of all of the findings within that document. That document is usually presented at the end of the year um, for the previous year. So you know, as you go, as we look at the financial statements and the management letter that's produced by the outside auditors, that gives us, um, you know, a better understanding of things that we need to maybe pay more attention to, or things that we have to review, or look at, you know, best practice in terms of how we're doing things or how we need to change. So that's something, um, Council Farwell, that we have um, as oversight in terms of the auditing. All right, and the last question that I have, Madam Chair, uh, actually involves uh, something that I've spoken to Mr. Morris about, and I, I'll just ask the auditor tonight, and we can go over it in more detail at another meeting. But if you look at the accounts documents that are usually provided to us, you'll see Amazon, 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 Amazon. And if you add it up in the aggregate, um, I'm not so sure we weren't up over a million dollars or two million dollars. My only concern with that is that if we're buying, if, if we have multiple departments, including the school department, buying the same item, then why shouldn't that go out to bid and we try to get it at a, at a reduced or a more appropriate price? And you, you may want to just take a look at some of those entries that are Amazon all the time. And I, I know, Mike, I spoke with you about it. I just get uneasy when I see that category, which, which really fragments our ability to understand what we're purchasing at what price and for what purpose, when I would much prefer to see a particular item that it's purchased all the time, uh, you know, lumped together into, a, into an RFP or a bid. I, I don't know if I'm making sense because I don't have your financial speak 
so to so to say, but uh, that, that always worried me. No, you are making sense. I mean, under Chapter 30B, there's different guidelines, uh, you know, over certain thresholds. And if Mike wanted to talk about this more, for, you know, in more detail, he could. But after over a certain amount, you have to have, you have to go out to bid. And so those are things that we, you know, we have to be mindful of. As I look at policies and procedures, you know, departments, you know, we're letting them know that if, you know, if something's under state contract, it doesn't have to go out to bid. So we're always encouraging departments, you know, to do that. And then, you know, in terms of Amazon, in terms of we have a contract with W.B. Mason. And so when you're looking at office supplies and I'm reviewing what's coming, um, you know, in front of me, I'm looking at, you know, what are people purchasing? And a lot of, from the invoices that I've reviewed, I'll over the last couple of months, a lot of the Amazon purchases that I see are for different um, material that the school department's um, using within the classroom. And I don't know if that particular item could also be purchased at WB Mason, but what I could do is as we move forward with implementing the policies and procedures, you know, letting people know that if there's office supplies that you can purchase for WB Mason, we're encouraging you to purchase through WB Mason. And anything that can't be purchased through WB Mason, you know, if you find another vendor that you could um, possibly purchase that for. And a lot of these things are addressed when we do reimbursements. Because a lot of the reimbursements are, have to adhere to, you know, policies and there's certain thresholds and things that we can reimburse employees for. So, you know, with that, we have to, you know, explain what you can and cannot. I encourage departments that if it's something that a vendor can accept a purchase order, because a purchase order is a, leading, a, a legal binding contract between the city and the vendor that we are obligated to pay them a certain amount of money. But if they, I encourage departments to do a purchase order and not to purchase it and get reimbursed. That's the last, um, that would be my last suggestion, you know, in terms of purchasing things because it's easier to track when you just, um, you're going through a vendor, going through a PO, and the vendor will accept the purchase order and then you can make the purchase. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. That was so informative. Um, I have a question to also regarding to the open um, checkbooks, the website that it gets posted online. How has that been updated? Because I know when we had the previous auditor, and you also mentioned it, the staffing issues, that was very behind on being updated on the website. So how is that? Is that current as we speak, or is it still? I'd have to look into it to find out when it was last updated, but that's something that, you know, I'll be looking into as I move forward. And But I can, I can look and see when the last update that was run. A lot of the open checkbook, because it's coming on immunis, there's different updates that are done. Um, just I'm remembering back to when I was working in the budget office where it would pull information on a daily basis. But I can, I'll look into it and I'll, I'll see if that's still occurring. And speaking of Munis, also another thing that we do in this committee is we review the warrants and a lot of the questions that we usually ask is because there's a, a lack of information on the descriptions of what was paid. And then we've always asked if there's any way with the software to provide a more detailed information so that way when we look at the expense, we'll know more of what it's about, what was it paid, what? So what we've done is um, within the purchase order guide, we've explained to departments what should, on, when you're entering a requisition, there's only so many characters that you can include within that space. So the mo first, we outline how to actually, up, how to put your requisition in. So the description may say it's for um, the 911 grant and it will have the year, and it will have the grant information. And then there's another line that will go more in, into detail of what they're actually purchasing. So, and then because we're having all the departments scan the invoices into the PO, if you want to see detailed list of what was purchased, we can just run, we can just run that purchase order and we can just print all the POs, you know, or we can, put, we can print the purchase order for that particular payment. But within Munis, we're tracking, you know, all of the invoices. So there's, we're trying to be transparent as we, as we can. The outside auditors, 
when they come in and they're reviewing our records and making sure that things are paid properly, they're able to go into our system, run a report, and get all the information. It's, it's there without going to different, you know, four or five different file cabinets to find it. So, you know, if there's any questions that you have um, in terms of the warrant, we can provide information on what has been paid. We can give copies, but it's very accessible. Okay. Councilor Tavares. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I know you are, you are new to, actually new to this, and so are I. And uh, what I see on you, uh, you look like, you know, very, uh, with a lot of details, and also with a lot of definition and transparency, uh, very confidential when you explain all the details, very clear. Uh, basically, I learned a lot from you today, because like as you know, as my first time here, uh, well, like, you know, just to go back, I know you're talking about uh, you're going to be implementing policy and procedure. Uh, when are you talking about implement a policy and procedure? Meaning, like, you know, you didn't like the preview policy and procedure? No. So when any time I feel like when you go into the organization, you have a past practice. Mm -hmm. And when you have multiple um, managers in the department and there are no policies or procedures are written that are written, usually there's procedures, but they're just procedures that people have are used to doing or they'll have a way, they'll have just a recording of how to do that. But I think when you create a policy, it's training. It's getting um, departments to understand exactly what is expected compared to what they've been doing. And that has to be across the board. And I think that when you have, you know, different managers coming and going, this position had a vacant auditor, you know, for a period of time. So that when I'm putting together these policies and procedures, it's letting the departments know what I, what's expected and what they can expect from a department. Some departments may not even understand what our role is as an auditor. And, you know, as we're going through invoices, we're, we're reading through every single invoice. We're making sure that the services were provided within the proper fiscal year. We're looking to see if it's a, an item that can even be, um, that can be purchased or should have been purchased. So there's a lot of review. You know, a lot of people think, oh, you should just pay these invoices and get them paid. But there's a lot of review, more than one to two eyes that are reviewing this to make sure that what goes out the door is going out legally. Um, so that's why, you know, put in, I, this was implemented in August. It's a process. So we had a meeting um, three weeks ago just to get feedback. So before we implemented, we found out what was the process. How were people paying invoices? How are they putting requisition? How, who was approving who was approving it? What was the workflow? And so that started in the summer when I started meeting with the, um, you know, the account um, payable clerks, meeting with the department heads, meeting with my staff. And so we had several meetings, video calls, going over and getting feedback from departments in terms of how they were doing things. And then just reviewing that and looking at what is a way we can make this more efficient. How can we save paper? How can we start automating the process that we're currently doing? And looking at are there things that we're doing that are duplication, that's taking time from the supervisors, when it could be something that's done up front, but it might be a little more time within our office in terms of how we're reviewing things. But I think that it provides for accuracy and it provides for errors not to, you know, for errors to be caught if there are any. Because every, you know, people, you know, are human and they make errors, but this allows us, you know, the opportunity in the staff and the, and just educating the staff on what we should or should not be doing. So I think that's, it's not that it didn't exist, but I think that as an auditor, I want to set expectations of how, based off of best practices, things um, should be done in terms of what I have learned over the last few years. So that's just one of the reasons why I'm putting these in place. A lot of times people have questions. So if you have a procedure, if you have a manual, if you have people leave the city and you know, they, they, you want to have something that you can hand out to another department head or to another staff that comes to the city to understand 
what the workflow is and how things are processed. And so that's why I am working really hard in implementing policies and procedures, making sure that people are cross-trained in the department so that we don't have you know, an issue in terms of turnover and making sure things are um, processed in a timely manner. Uh, actually, I'm so agree with you because like, you know, especially for new city council like myself, uh, when it was reviewed, the book budget was like, you know, for myself was not, was very confused, uh, was not detailed definition with the transparency, uh, make a lot of confuse. Uh, I was work with those old city council, like, you know, uh, been before I am, for me to try to understand, because like you said, is a lot of approaches, a lot of, uh, is a lot of items saying like, you know, others. Like, you know, others is question mark because it was, okay, by, what do you mean others? It's taking so long to figure it out and to process, again, as a new city council to understand, is very hard. And the many time when the people ask you a question outside, um, again, for new city councilor, is harder again because you don't know how to answer the question. But I'm so glad, like, you know, um, the way I just, you know, explained it, uh, you, you, you did it very well. Uh, and then I hope, like, you know, um, all your team will work with you that way and uh, make it more transparency uh, and here uh, for new city councilor, also as well for the public. Um, and in the meantime, when they come here, you, we ask them a question, they're gonna be able to answer the question because as my understanding, when we was asked everybody a question because it was a lot of details, like, you know, we couldn't process or understand, uh, they couldn't answer the question. Even themselves, they didn't even know how to explain the details. Was very confused. And uh, I hope, uh, uh, even though I'm not gonna be here, who knows, uh, whatever's gonna be here um, to make it more easy, more understandable, and then whatever they come from the city councilor, they be able to explain the way you did it with all the details, all the definition, with all the confidence, because you have all that, you know what I mean? It's just that's the first time I, I, I see somebody coming from the bus just like you. Uh, I'm very proud already. Um, another thing too, um, to go back again, uh, actually Councillor Mandy just asked this question about uh, when do you guys do approach and pay uh, the invoice, did the taxpayer have access to kind of look into, um, you guys have those access for taxpayer? Like so, for example, if you don't want to review what's going on, can they be able to access? So that's through the open checkbook. I can give you more information in terms of what information can be seen. So, if, or what information can be researched or what information you can get from that system. And I think sometimes, you know, a lot of the systems that we work on, technology changes. And there may be a function that we haven't used in the past. There's a lot of functions that we're learning just in the auditing that we've never used in in Munis, that's really saving us time. So I'll look into that and see what the residents and the public can see and what information they can pull up. And then you just, a lot of times when you are um, running reports like that, they're pulling from different fields. So I, at least I can go through, look at the fields of where it's pulling from and look at the fields of where we're having departments provide additional information. And that hopefully should mirror what we're seeing in the municipal, you know, as it's a report that you know, is just pretty much pulling data from our system. Okay, great. And then I have lots of question. Uh, we're talking about grant. Uh, as I understand it, like again, I'm new city council, I learned like, you know, the city didn't get a lot of grants. But when we're doing the budget book, we're going through the budget book, like, you know, wasn't, wasn't explained about anything about grants. Like, who got the grant? Uh, like, you know, for example, like, you know, I know uh, some organization got the grant. Okay, my question is, um, do you guys, when you guys grant the grant to any organization, do you guys audit organization, like, you know, for example, I'm just give you an example just to break it down a little simple. Um, I got the organization. I got the grant from the city. Do you guys are that? Like, you know, if the, the organization uh, do exactly what they proposing mm -hmm. to do so. Mm -hmm. And do you guys record, like, you know, who who get the grant? And then what they do? Can, do you guys, uh, I know you, you knew you still work on it. That's why you say you work on implementation on the policy and procedures. Is, is something uh, I like you to take a little in consideration, uh, especially when the grant, grant come to be more transparency, who get, who get the grants, and then again, it is something, how does those organizations get the grants, you know, based whatever they apply for, based whatever they 
get the grant if they do exact. You know, this is my little advice because I don't have a lot of questions. City got all the grant, what they do, with the help? Like, I don't know how to answer those questions either, just to make it easy for new city council again, or even for right. the public, for the taxpayer. Um, Councilor, so I, I can answer that question. So we're um, in the process of, so MUNIS, which is our financial system, has a grant module that hasn't been used in the past. So moving forward, so anything for FY23, once the grants go to city council and they have been you know, awarded by the state, all of that information in terms of the agency, in terms of the amount of the grant, the department that's receiving the grant, as you, you'll see on the agenda when you go to city council, when it gets referred to finance, we're tracking and we have a tracking sheet of the date that it moves to finance and when it's approved by city council. We have it by council order. We have a, you know all the information in terms of agency, what the grant's for. I'll be working with departments because a lot of the grants are either reimbursement grants or they're grants that are given up front, or there's a percent of the money of the grant that's given up front, and there's a tracking mechanism in terms of expenditures and making sure that we're sending progress reports to the state. So some of the grants that we have, it's my responsibility to send that information in terms of what it has been expensed on, where has it been expensed, and it just goes back to the policies and procedures. When we have a grant, you're encumbering the total grant amount, and that way we're able to track what has been expensed, how much money has come in, are we sending out the, um, the monthly reports based off when the grant. So I think that that is something that I'm implementing now and working with the finance department, you know, hopefully that will also be a part of our budget document because the city receives a lot of money and we do a lot of programming and there's a lot of things that um, are beneficial to residents and to even you know local governments in terms of what we're getting for you know just the revitalization that's going on in the city, so we are moving forward with that initiative. And you know I can provide you if you're looking at you know we're looking at FY23, but then we'll be going back. Hopefully, when we're fully staffed, you know that will be um, an initiative for the assistant auditor and the accountant that we just hired but uh, you'll be able to then have that information. Yeah. Mention of the vacant, a lot of vacancy that you know you guys been like, you know, have a trouble to fill the position in. Uh, okay, I have a question here. Uh, like for example, like you guys been have a lot of vacancy. When does you guys been have an audit? Uh, how does this work? Because I know, uh, I, I just wanna try to break down to kind of just make you easy to understand. Uh, for example, you have this position for so long, you never fill this position, and uh, ended here with the budget. The money go back to the state, or what, what does this work? Can you, I'm sorry, Council, could you ask your question again? I know, this is kind of a little confused, because uh, some, someone asked me this question, basically, that's why I'm asked this question. Uh, well, they were saying, like, you know, for example, the money for the vacancy, like, you know, you have, uh, example, 10 vacancy for a little while, and the, here the budget, I know those money never been paid because like you mm -hmm. never get the hire, those fill that position. What's gonna happen with that money? So at the end of the fiscal year, if the department will say my, my department, we have positions that were unfilled, we would have a surplus in our salary and wages line. That money cannot be spent on anything other than what it has been appropriated for. So if department has additional expenditures, they have to come and it has to be approved by the city council if they were to use it in a different statutory category, if it was goods and supplies, or purchase of services. But at the end of the fiscal year, anything that we have in terms of a budget that hasn't been spent is part of the surplus that goes into what the Department of Revenue certifies as free cash. There's a lot of components that the state looks at to determine how much money does Brockton have in terms of revenue that they'll be able to use for the next fiscal year. That calculation comes one from surpluses that we have in budgets where money is unspent at the end of the fiscal year, and it comes from estimated revenue surplus of what was estimated during the fiscal year. So a combination of that and there's other 
you know, items in the budget that they look at, um, the net amount would be what they certified. So any additional savings helps the city in the future in terms of funding um, projects. Because our funding source is mainly, you know, property taxes, local receipts, and state aid. So that is and this is the last one, I promise. Uh, um, well, the last count, one. Count, counsel, yeah. yes, we have uh, our guest here, uh, Mr. Uh, Mike Morris, and then I'd like just to give him an opportunity just to speak very quickly because then we have to finish because we're going to start. Yeah. So you'll ask your question, write it down, and then when we have our next meeting, you ask. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Please. You answer yeah. all the questions. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening, Councillors. Good evening. So I know that uh, Councillor Powell had a few questions to ask you, but I don't know if you have any presentation, anything to say, or just... I wasn't prepared for a presentation, but I think, uh, as you know, as I mentioned during the budget hearings, uh, procurement, the procurement laws were set up and enacted in order to um, put together some laws, rules, and regulations on the way municipalities purchase goods and services. So uh, my, my department, the procurement department, enforces those procurement laws. There's three main uh, laws that I use on a day-to-day -day basis. That's Chapter 30B, which is the purchase of uh, goods and services. Chapter 149 uh, deals with um, building construction. Mm -hmm also known as um, vertical construction and chapter 3039M, which pertains to um, public construction, um, uh, roads, uh, pipes, and, and parks. Councilor Falwell. Actually, I touched upon it earlier uh, with, uh, with the auditor, and that is that when I look over the different printouts for purchases, I'm, I'm concerned that it looks, I, I hate to use the word bid splitting because I know that's, that's a term that's illegal, but I'm not convinced that we drill down on a particular fiscal year on all of the items that we're going to purchase throughout the entire city for every department, including the school department, and then we get a contract for it. And I, I, I'm not picking on Amazon, but as I mentioned to you months ago, when I see Amazon, 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 and I think it's up, I want to say, a couple of million dollars, all of the items that we're buying, are they covered perhaps by a state or a local bid? And, and I'm not quite sure how to work with the school department and other departments to make sure that we, uh, for example, the school department will buy building supplies, will buy building supplies. Uh, it looks like they'll go to Lowe's and they'll buy it, because there's a need for it. Uh, and and I, I do understand that sometimes public property has to act expeditiously because something has happened. But talk to me a little bit about, in your opinion, how we could be a little bit more cohesive in how we view all the different purchases and making sure that if, if, if we can, we go out to bid and then we get the best possible price as opposed to just picking up the phone or going on the internet and buying something and having Amazon deliver it? Sure. Um, I can speak for the city side. I don't really see much overlap. Uh, different departments, they rarely purchase similar uh, products or supplies, and when they do, um, they do come to my office and we discuss the best uh, way to obtain these uh, products and I always offer out you know state contracts or cooperative contracts that are out there that they can buy off of um, both uh, Lowe's and uh, Home Depot are on a, a state contract for building supplies so I guess it's just a matter of preference be between the two um, as far as Amazon on the city side the only department, uh, based on my reports that I reviewed, that purchase from Amazon is the library, and that's for promotional items and books, uh, which are sometimes hard to find in, in other places. Um, on the school side, I would presume they're aware that we have an office supply contract with W.B. Mason, but that contract has a lot of um, exclusions and items that can't be um, purchased from off supplies. So as Karen mentioned, 
I haven't seen really detailed invoices, but if they're for classroom supplies, that could be something that's not uh, categorized as office supplies. Um, Amazon um, Marketplace is uh, on a cooperative contract, Omni Partners, and um, they bid out the services of online digital marketplace, and Amazon was one of the uh, winners of the contract for that. Okay. So, so legally, uh, from a procurement perspective, uh, they can purchase from Amazon, but I'm not sure what exactly the items that they're purchasing. Um, I would assume that they're using WB Masons for office supplies because it's a tremendous discount that we get on that contract. Well, as we get into it more, when we have another accounts committee meeting and I, I get a chance to see a printout, maybe something will jump out at me and then I can, you know, I can run it by you. And oh, definitely. We can take a, a deeper look into it. Look at it. Yes. I mean, I think it's, this is one, pur purchasing, procurement, and auditing is one of those things that I think constantly evolve and hopefully get better over time. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. So thank you so much for okay. uh, both of you for being here. So it's okay. at 6.55, and um, the motion to adjourn the meeting. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Yes. Second. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.